Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV, and also welcome back to my Linux Crash Course series. And within this series, what I do is I cover one very important topic around Linux one video at a time. And in today's video, what we'll do is talk about the identity of our Linux servers. And by identity, what I'm referring to is the concept around host names as well as domain names. Now, if your goal is to change the host name of your Linux server, well, I have a dedicated video that goes over that exact process, and I'll leave a card for that video right about here. Now, more specifically in this video, what I'm going to do is talk about host names and domain names on a more generic level. What they are, what they actually correlate to, as well as any features or capabilities that overlap. And you know what? There's some confusion around host names and domain names, so my goal with this video is to eliminate as much of that confusion as I can. But before we get into that, I want to take a moment to mention the sponsor for the Linux Crash Course series, Linode. And well, Linode is awesome. Not only are they the official cloud provider for Learn Linux TV, Linode's platform is actually a great way to get started with Linux. You can learn Linux by setting up some awesome web apps, you know, things like Nextcloud, WordPress, you could even set up your very own Kubernetes cluster. Another reason why Linode is awesome is that they're a perfect fit for this tutorial series because if you are learning Linux, then there's no greater way to get started with Linux than actually using it and getting your hands on it. And using their platform, you can spin up your very own Linux server in minutes. They have a great number of distributions there, including, but not limited to, the staples such as Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora, and many others. In fact, every distro that I cover in this series is also covered by Linode. So definitely check out Linode by using the URL that you see on the screen right now. And by using that URL, you will not only let Linode know that you appreciate their sponsorship of this channel, but you'll also get $100 in free credit towards your new account. And that credit is good for up to 60 days. Thank you so much to Linode for sponsoring the Linux Crash Course series. I really appreciate it. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about host names and domain names. So whenever we set up a Linux server or workstation, while installing our Linux distribution of choice, we'll often be prompted for what to name the server. Now, some distros won't prompt you to type the name during installation and will instead use a default name, but quite a few distributions will actually give you the opportunity to name your server during installation. When that prompt does appear, if it appears, you might actually consider not naming your server at that particular point in time and naming it later. But if you don't actually come up with a name for your server, then what you'll see is something similar to what I have on the screen right now. I'm connected to a server called Ubuntu. And you can see that right in the bash prompt. Now, if I only have one server, that's, well, I guess okay. We have an Ubuntu server. If that's our only Ubuntu server, then I suppose the name is fine. When it comes to most organizations, you're going to have more than one server. And if they're all named Ubuntu, then it's going to be very hard to tell them apart. For example, consider this hypothetical network diagram that I have on the screen right now. In this diagram, the administrator kept the default name for each server that they set up. I don't know about you, but this is really confusing to me. Which one is the file server? Which one is the web server? I have no idea. Another issue with accepting default names when it comes to your Linux server is that the bash prompt will often include the host name or domain name right in the prompt. So if the name is the same on each server, we won't even know which server we're issuing commands to, which also means that we could easily end up running commands against the wrong machine. However, if we give each of our servers an actual name, something that's more descriptive, for example, a name that corresponds to the purpose or use case for the server, then it becomes much easier to tell them apart. And we can see that in this diagram right here. And in my opinion, I think that's easier to understand. Now, like I mentioned earlier, today we are going over host names as well as domain names. But for right now, let's actually focus on host names. All Linux servers have a host name, and that's true even if it's the same on each. By default, a Linux installation will often have a default name, such as Ubuntu or simply localhost. If you're curious what the host name is of your server, especially if your bash prompt doesn't actually have the host name there, then in that case, you could use the host name command. And what that'll do 
is print the host name of the device that you're currently connected to. So what we see right here is that the host name of this particular instance, this machine right here that I'm connected to, is currently set to Ubuntu. We knew that from the bash prompt, it's written right there in the prompt. But, you know, like I mentioned, that may not always be the case. So if for some reason you don't see the actual host name there in the prompt, then the host name command will actually give you the host name. But what exactly is a host name? The best way to think of a host name is that it's the lowest level name that a server can have. You can name your server whatever you'd like, such as Web Server 1, File Server 2, or whatever name you think best describes the server or distinguishes it from other servers that you maintain. You can also come up with your own naming scheme. For example, I've seen people name their servers after mythological creatures. That's a fun naming scheme. So, you know what? You can have a little bit of fun with this if you want. Now, in regards to naming servers, we could actually stop right here. Host names are required. Every server has one, but not every server is going to be a part of a domain or have a domain name. But even though domain names are completely optional, I highly recommend that you continue with this tutorial because understanding how the two overlap and how they're different is very important. So let's go ahead and talk about domain names right now. Like host names, a domain name is a name that you can apply to something to refer to it as. However, domain names are a lot more powerful when compared to a host name and offer additional benefits and flexibility. The simplest and perhaps most common application of a domain name is to name a website. For example, the domain name for this particular channel is learnlinux.tv. That domain actually exists on the internet. You could type it into a web browser right now and it'll take you right to the website for this channel. But actually, a domain name is more than that. And the best way to understand the difference between a host name and a domain name is to think of host names as first names and domain names as surnames. For instance, let's say you have a family name that has a surname of Anderson. Perhaps there's three members within this family, John, Sally, and Thomas. If we were to write the names of these individuals the same way we do with servers, we'd probably write them something like this. So for example, John.Anderson, Sally.Anderson, and Thomas.Anderson. Now, of course, you would never write your name anything like this when you were filling out a form or something like that, but the idea here is that we have a first name and a last name, and that's not all that different from a host name and a domain name in regards to a Linux server. Now, this isn't written exactly the same way as a domain name would be written, when it comes to a human being, maybe we would actually write it something like this. In this case, we have person as the top level domain, Thomas is that person's name, and Anderson is their family name. So when we start to break it down like this, it might make more sense. So to show the same example in regards to a Linux server's name, we might have something similar to this. Maybe webserver.learnlinux.tv, Maybe we have an internal database server called db.learnlinux.tv. And this is a very common example of how a domain name might be written for a database server. And in this particular example, the host name for this instance right here, this hypothetical name that you see on the screen right now is db, that's the host name. So if we were actually connected to this server right now via SSH, and the domain name was actually set to db.learnlinux.tv, then the bash prompt would most likely read j at db. And that's because most bash configurations by default will simply show the host name, not the entire domain name in the prompt. So with this example right here, we'll have a host name of web server and the domain is exactly the same, learnlinux.tv, but the fully qualified domain name is going to be webserver.learnlinux.tv. The fully qualified domain name is the entirety of the domain name, including the host name and the company's domain name combined into one. So anytime you see the term fully qualified domain name, what that's actually asking you about is the host name plus domain name, which together again constitutes a fully qualified domain name. Now, something that might be a bit confusing here is that if you wanted to visit the actual website for this channel, you would simply type in learnlinux.tv. You wouldn't type in webserver.learnlinux.tv. You would type in learnlinux.tv. Now to understand fully how that works, we'd have to completely dive into DNS in more detail than we would be able to cover here. But what I'll do is try to explain it in summary so that way you'll still understand it. 
When a company has a web server, typically what they're doing is they're looking for requests. And if a request comes in for a domain name or a website name that the server is responsible for, it'll accept that request and then serve the web page. It doesn't really matter to the user if the user happened to be connected to web server one.learnlinux.tv, web server two.learnlinux.tv. All the user really cares about is that they get to the website that they're trying to access. And the way that this typically works is you have an A record or address record for a DNS entry. And DNS itself is just a mapping between an IP address and a domain name. So by typing learnlinux.tv in your browser, what your browser is going to do is issue a DNS lookup request for learnlinux.tv. It's looking for the A record. And then whatever IP address that corresponds to that A record is what's going to be served to the user. And in case you're curious, what we could do right now is see what that looks like. We could type nslookup, and we could issue that command against learnlinux.tv. And when I press enter, you can see the DNS information for that particular DNS name. And we see the IP address right here. So that's how our browser knows how to get to this particular website. I control the DNS on my side which also means that I control whatever the A record actually points to. And in this case, it points to the IP address of 172.105.22.139. Now, all of that is off on the side and not the core concept that I'm trying to go over in this video. But I did want to talk a little bit about the difference between a fully qualified domain name and a website name or website address, A record, if you will, which are very related but also somewhat different concepts. So let's just stick to the difference between host names and fully qualified domain names for the rest of this video. Now, like I mentioned before, domain names, unlike host names, are completely optional. You don't have to have a domain name applied to any server at all. On the other hand, host names are required. If your Linux server is known on the network only as localhost, that's still a host name, not a very descriptive host name, but a host name nonetheless. Going back to our people analogy, my first name is Jay. If you were to meet me in real life, it's not required for you to know my surname in order to get my attention. You could simply say, hey Jay, and that would probably be enough. Well, as long as no one else in the room is also named Jay, as long as that's not the case, then you'll definitely get my attention. Now, if there was more than one person in the room named Jay, then yeah, you would have to use my surname in order to get my attention. Now, let's actually take a look at that same concept in the form of a server name. Let's say, for example, that you're working with two clients today and you're working on web server issues. Maybe two clients have issues with their web server and it's up to you to fix it. So maybe the web server is named web server for client A. And well, what if it's also named web server for client B as well? Now, this is where it starts to get a little confusing because if you have the same server name like I mentioned earlier, then you're not really going to know fully which one you're connected to. If I'm connected to a server right now named web server, am I connected to client A's server named web server or the one for client B? Well, without a domain name, we really don't know. But if we have a domain name, then we might have a fully qualified domain name that looks like this. Now, this is better right here because with this name, we know that we are referring to a web server, that's the host name, but specifically a server named web server that exists in acme.com as the domain. You could think of the domain as a namespace and the host name as the individual name of that particular server. It's completely possible that you will absolutely run into two completely different clients with servers that have the same name. I've seen it happen and you will too. But with a fully qualified domain name, like you see right here, then we absolutely know which one we're connected to. So maybe after we're done working with Acme, then we're going to connect to Shinra's network and work on their web server. In that case, we have a fully qualified domain name that looks like this. And you could think of a fully qualified domain name as being something that could potentially save you from embarrassment or worse. I mean, think about it. What if Shinra asked you to restart their web server? That's something that they want you to do for them. So you go ahead and do that, but you're accidentally connected to Acme's web server and you restart that one instead. Now that's a pretty awkward situation because in that example, you've actually restarted the wrong server. 
Again, a fully qualified domain name makes it very clear which one you're working with. Now, another topic that I want to discuss is the concept of a domain controller. We're not actually going to go into too much detail about this, but I wanted to bring it up because a lot of people seem to think that a domain controller is required to fully utilize a fully qualified domain name inside your organization. Now, a domain controller can definitely be useful, but it's not required. I'm going to repeat that. A domain controller is not required to utilize a fully qualified domain name. Now, I think where the majority of that misconception comes from is the fact that the majority of companies seem to utilize a domain controller and many IT employees that work with those domain controllers every day, they might actually think that that's the norm and it kind of is. But even though it's the norm, that doesn't imply that it's required. But if a domain controller isn't required, what exactly is it? And why do people use it so often? Well, a domain controller is a server or perhaps multiple servers. And these servers control how a domain is used and how resources within that domain are assigned. And the most common type of domain controller out there is Microsoft's Active Directory. And you'll see that on quite a few networks out there. And implementing a domain controller can simplify how your domain is managed and give you additional functionality. But a domain controller is just that, added functionality. And depending on how many servers you have within your network, implementing a domain controller might actually work against you. It might represent an additional administrative burden that can create unnecessary work. For example, if your operation is somewhat small and you only have, I don't know, five or six servers, should you set up a domain controller? Well, probably not. In that case, you could probably make a fair argument that the work that's required to set up and maintain a domain controller is unnecessary and more work than just manually naming things yourself. Sure, that's an oversimplification, but often when someone asks me how I implemented my domain with all of my servers, they'll ask me how I set up the domain controller. When I tell them that there isn't one, the reaction isn't what they expected. Maybe they're making an assumption that all companies have a domain controller because the company that they work for has one, but again, that's not always the case. Now, I'm going to stop this particular video right about here. This is a very big topic and I don't want to overload you guys with, you know, a lot of information or too much information. It's important to understand the difference between host names and domain names and sure, they're related, but you don't have to have both. Host names are required and domain names are not. But when combined together, they form the fully qualified domain name that can be very important and very useful when it comes to naming your servers. Again, I have a video on this channel already that goes over how to change your host name, so I'll point you over to that if that's what you wanted to do. But hopefully by now, if you are at all confused about the difference between a host name and a domain name, I'm hoping that this video has helped you out. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again very soon.